This is Pastor Aaron at Oasis Baptist Church, and thank you for checking us out online. I pray that this message is an encouragement to you. Thank you for the music. Thank you for sharing, Melissa. The, as I was sitting down there singing and worshiping with you all, the thought that came to my mind is really just a song. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. God is good. God is good. We are, if you are a guest and you are with us for the first time, we have been uh, flying through the book of Galatians. We are in week number three, and we will start this morning in verse number six. And uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed, I, I love being able to teach. Uh, through the Word of God. And so this morning we are going to continue in Galatians chapter 1. We'll start in verse number 6. And one of the, the core desires of my heart is that I've stated this over the last few weeks is that we would leave this study having a greater understanding of the gospel. That we completely understand and realize that the gospel needs to be an all-encompassing reality in every aspect of our lives. One of my close friends here in town is uh, Pastor Paul Gotthart, and he says this, What we believe about the gospel will impact every aspect of your spiritual life. What we believe about the gospel should and will impact every aspect of our spiritual life. Just stop for a moment as we've, we've looked at the gospel and uh, we will continue to look through that in, in Galatians. But as we look at this, think about this. Forgiveness begins with the gospel. God's love for you is in the gospel. Maybe this morning you are here and you are a little bit skeptical of what's going on at church and you're skeptical about who God is and if, if, if Jesus really is this, this guy who came and died and rose again. Maybe you're a little bit skeptical, you're a little hesitant. Do you realize that the gospel, it's only in the gospel that God would, would tug upon your heart, the Holy Spirit would tug upon your heart to allow you to understand what that is. Maybe this morning you're on the opposite end of that. You are a believer. You know Christ as Savior. Maybe you're a little tired. You're burnt out. It's been a long month, weeks, years, whatever it's been, and you've just been going, 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 and you're just tired. I'm ready to just throw in the towel. I cannot handle this anymore. I'm done with church. I don't know how many of you have heard it. I've heard it so many times. The church has hurt me too bad, and I don't want anything to do with it. I'm just too tired. I've been burnt out. Do you realize it's in the gospel that I would say we need to go back to, be grounded in, and grasp a hold of God. And in the gospel, all of those things begin to change. Prayer. Prayer is only because of the gospel that Jesus Christ died and rose again and sits at the right hand of the Father and is the mediator between you and God the Father. In prayer is the gospel. Your development as a believer is because of the Holy Spirit living in you, which is because of the gospel. Everything that we do, every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our spiritual life is tied up in the gospel. Here's the problem, though. We so often live our Christian lives. We live as though the gospel was an experience that we had one time, and we leave it there. The gospel wasn't an experience that happened once. It's something that is in us and through us and everything that we do, and that is the, it brings us joy, it brings us peace, it gives us the comfort. Why can you go into a country and serve the Lord for four years and see seven people come to Christ? Many would say, it's not worth it. Man, what am I doing? What was it in India? I forget the... the the missionary, but served his whole life in India, died never seeing a convert. Now it's one of the fastest growing believing countries in the world. Why? There was some man who was willing day in and day out and 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 never get to see the fruit of what he did. But it's because of the gospel burning inside of him. 
that he continued steadfastly. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, what? Save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He was determined to know nothing else except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What is that? It's the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this. It's a, I'm not reading it verbatim. But for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, to them that are under the law as under the law, to them that are without law as without law, to the weak became I as weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What? And this I do. Why did I go through all of those things? Why have I done all of these things? What does it say? And this I do for what? The gospel's sake. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Let your actions, let everything you do be as it becometh of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That whether I come and see you or else I'm absent, I don't make it back to you. That I would hear that you're of your actions, that I would hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. All of this, it's, it's lives being impacted and lived for the gospel. Today, we're going to dive into verses 6 through 10. And we see that Paul, uh, we've talked about this the last two weeks, it says that he was marveled. I marvel that ye are so soon removed. I am amazed, I am astonished at what has taken place, that you have so quickly left the gospel. They would be willing to leave the grace of Jesus Christ. No, they didn't leave and lose salvation, but they left grace behind and begin to add to and do the works, begin to work for the gospel was being corrupted. The gospel was being add to, added to and taken away. Paul lived his life, was determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus taught and showed the gospel. Paul challenged the churches at Philippi to have their actions become of the gospel. And in order for you and I and the gospel to permeate our lives, we must know it. We must know it. It's not good enough. It's not good enough for me to just sit in a church and sit in a chair and say I went to church and say I know Jesus. It's not good enough. I have got to know the gospel message. If I don't, do you know what I do? I am no different than the churches there in Galatia and I will quickly leave and I will come over here because something else sounded good. No, we must know the gospel. If the gospel is this powerful, if the gospel is this awesome, listen, there is one thing that is being completely destroyed inside of our country and around the world. What is it? It is that we can de destroy the gospel message. And if we can destroy the gospel message, we can impact so many other things. And our churches are letting it happen right inside the doors. Because we, we don't know it. We think, well, I got saved. I had an experience with God one day. And we leave it there. It's not about an experience that was left there. It's not about that. It's the gospel message permeating in and through everything that we do. Everything of who we are. This morning... My prayer and my prayer through this series in Galatians is that we would know the gospel, that it would grip our hearts and that it would impact us in every area of our lives. I've entitled this sermon this morning, The Effects of a Corrupt Gospel. The Effects of a Corrupt Gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, we'll start in verse number 6. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go there. Um, if not, they are on the screen, but I... I, I I would pray that you would just dive in. I encourage this all the time. I've said this now every week. Uh, I hope that you will read through what we're going through. Um, the one thing I love about a verse-by-verse -verse study is, one, it's consistently all the way through. 
Um, but you can read along with it. It's not something that you have to figure out where we're going next. So we're in 6 through 10. Next week we'll start in verse number 11. 11. You're good, you're good, you're good. <laughs> so we'll be in verse number 11 next week. And uh, we've got a few more weeks in the first chapter. Um, but uh, I, I hope that you will read it throughout the week. And, and if you have questions, send them to me uh, or grab me uh, at the end of the service or before the service or write it down and get it to me and I'll do my best to answer it if it's not answered throughout the, the sermon. But Galatians 1 verse number 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Verse number 10, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For, I, for if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of of Christ. Father, I ask this morning that your word would speak truths into our lives. God, that anything that is said from my mouth would be ordained of you this morning and that you would be glorified in Jesus name. Amen. The effects of a corrupt gospel, the very first simple thought is this, souls are lost. The effects of a corrupt gospel, I would say that this is just makes perfect sense, right? If the gospel is corrupt, then the people don't hear the true gospel. Souls are lost. When we desert grace and attempt to replace it with our own goodness, souls are lost. No, we cannot lose salvation. If you have truly and genuinely came to a place of seeking God for salvation, you cannot lose that salvation. However... There are many times that we in our Christian lives begin to add to it, and we'll look at some of those things here this morning. Paul said, I am stunned, I am amazed, I marvel at how quickly you left grace to another gospel. These folks, think about this for just a minute. Have you ever looked at somebody and thought to yourself, man, how were they sitting under? Paul was probably, outside of Christ, the greatest teacher to ever teach the Word of God. If he's not second, he's got to be in the top five of the goats of Bible teaching. Some of you care, some of you have no idea. You're like, what does that mean? It's all right, another day. But he's one of the best. And yet, these people sitting under one of the greatest teachers of all time left when he left man i'm standing here and i'm thinking (laughs) you got paul and here i am somewhere over here some of you will leave and it's not because i'm a bad teacher and i'm not paul paul was one of the best but yet they fled they left And they did their own thing. They willingly rejected the truths of grace that they had learned. Today, I would say this, there is a great, as great, if not the greatest time ever, the need to continue to preach and teach the truths of the gospel. It must never cease to be taught. Paul said this, 2 Peter chapter 1. Wherefore, in verse number 12, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. What are those things? The gospel, the the word of God, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Even as my Lord, or even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me, moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my, de- after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Paul said, I will constantly, I will never cease to share the gospel and to teach the truths of the word of God. 
Even though you know them, I will continue to reiterate them. Why? Because there's coming a day where I won't be here and you need to remember them and you need to take what you've been given and taught and you need to give it to somebody else. The picture that she showed was amazing. Her on one side, somebody that she's discipling in the middle, and somebody beside her that she is now discipling. That's what God had intended. God never said, go and make converts. God said, go and make disciples. See, I will not stand before God one day, and God's not going to look at me and go, well, Aaron, Pastor Aaron Flanagan, Oasis Baptist Church, your church never grew over 200, 2,000, that'd be cool, 200, (laughs) your church never got over 200 people. Um, I'm going to put you over here because you weren't successful. God's going to hold me accountable as a pastor, as a teacher, to teaching the truths of the Word of God. How did I protect? How did I love? How did I teach the Word of God? And I'm not, I don't have anything against a church that has a large attendance. That's not at all the point. But God said to go and make disciples. Making disciples is just that. It's pouring in. It's teaching the truths. It's making sure that it's in the front, in the forefront of everything. My job is to constantly, why, why, why? Because when it becomes corrupt, when it becomes perverted, what happens? Souls are lost. As soon as we get comfortable It isn't long before we can begin to embrace a false teaching. When you get comfortable, when the gospel is ignored, it will not be long before truths of the gospel are rejected. When the gospel is ignored, it will not be long before truths of the gospel are rejected. When a pastor might say something or when we say something along the lines, well, I've heard that story. If we get bored of the story of the gospel message, then we've got a lot of problems. My goal and my job is to teach the gospel message every Sunday and every day that I live. That should be all of our jobs and all of our goals. It can't get ignored. For it becomes ignored, it will be rejected. Look around your country. The gospel is ignored and therefore it's been rejected. Go in the south. The Bible Belt, right? I have people all the time that come through our city and they will ask about what it's like to raise kids and all these different things that people ask when they come to Vegas. How are you going to raise a kid in Sin City? I don't know. How do you raise a kid in the middle of Atlanta? I don't know. It's the same way. Sin is everywhere. But you know what's happened in a lot of our southern areas they're so comfortable with church that the gospel message it's just something that we do it's a part of our culture i'm glad but if it's not permeating in us souls will be lost people are being confused their faith was weakening they were deserting their faith It says in this passage of Scripture, I marvel that you are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Literally, when you look at that in some of your translations, it may use the word deserting. That they were literally leaving. In in this day and age, the word deserting was a military term. They voluntarily fled. They voluntarily left in war that was punishable by death. For them to leave their post, for them to leave that battlefield, it was punishable by death. And that's the same word that, they, that Paul was using. I marvel that you so soon removed, that you are so soon deserting from Him that called you into the grace of Christ. We spoke last week of the grace of God, that salvation is by grace. And it is. But salvation, grace, isn't just For salvation. Grace is in every aspect of our lives. Grace is is all encompassing in our Christian life. It is the grace of God. God giving to you. God doing in and through and for you. Which you cannot do for yourself. God doing in and through and for you. Which you cannot do for yourself. And think about this. This group. These Galatian churches were leaving the grace of God. They were were saying you know what. Uh. 
this was okay, but I need to begin to do all of these things. And they were beginning to, to learn that. Listen, when we begin to add to the gospel, it becomes not a gospel at all. And guess what I do? I don't share that with the next person. Guess what? Souls are lost. Because it's been corrupted in my mind and I begin to think I have to do something. The grace of God, what are we leaving? We are saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We stand in grace, Romans 5 and verse 2. We live by grace, 1 Corinthians 15. We are strengthened by grace, 2 Timothy 2. We endure by grace, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And when we begin to leave that and say, but I have to add to all of those things, we leave all of that. Because I am now good enough. I am now strong enough. I can now say and not say and I can do this on my own. When I have to add to it. The Judaizers that came in and they began to say what? It's now Jesus plus this religious law. Plus this religious action. Plus this thing. Plus this thing. When we do that, we begin to just take, we throw the grace all the way out. Because I am doing this on my own. The grace of God is that He is doing in and through me, which I cannot do on my own. Listen, I don't have the strength to live on my own. I don't have the willpower to say no to sin on my own. I can't stand strong on my own. Only in the grace of God. And when we flee all of that, we flee that as well. The path of Christ is only in and through the path of grace. We either pursue Him by grace or by works. It's in our own pride or in our humility that we go to Jesus Christ. To turn away from any part of the grace of Christ is to turn away from the power of God to that of a human effort. Those who seek to sustain their justification in any degree by the law, it says in Galatians 5 that they have fallen from grace. They have been severed from Christ. That is not, again, speaking of losing salvation. But listen to this real quick. It says, uh, John MacArthur said this as I was studying. It's that of polluting the pure stream of living grace by putting a barrier between oneself and Christ and therefore of being severed or separated from His power and from fellowship with Him. This is what happens when we flee, when we desert the grace and corrupt the gospel. There is the, the pure stream of grace that God is giving to us begins to get, get polluted and it, there begins to have divide. There begins to have all of those things because we are now severed. We are separated from that power and from the fellowship with Him. It's pride and humility. Pride or humility. We either seek God in one of those. I'm either seeking God in my pride. God, look at all these things I'm doing for you. God, look at all the things. This week I didn't even do this, 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 this. Look at how good I did. Or it's me looking at God in humility and saying, God, only by the grace of God that I didn't do that today. Only by the grace of God that I didn't act out. That I didn't say that. We must live in humility and not add to the grace of God, but be humble before God. Listen this morning, the effects of a corrupt gospel, when I begin to add to my salvation, is that souls are lost. The effects of a corrupt gospel is that there becomes trouble in the church. Verse number 7, we come into this, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which is we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. We look at this in verse number 7. There was trouble that was stirring. There was a perversion that was happening inside of the church. There was confusion taking place. The effects of distorting and corrupting the gospel is, is that, yes, souls are lost, but there's also a great trouble and a great perversion, a great confusion inside of the church. 
trouble and perversion. The Judaizers will get, were guilty of teaching another gospel. They had come in and distorted the truth. They had distorted and perverted the gospel of which there is only one. There is not another. And so there was confusion. There was fear. People began to leave. People began to desert it. The word pervert is this. It's to turn about. To change into an opposite character. To reverse. And the Judaizers were reversing the gospel. They were changing the gospel. They were turning it about. They had caused trouble inside of the church. That word trouble. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. The disciples out in the lake, remember, the storm is raging, everything's going on. Next thing you know, Jesus walking on the water, coming to them. What were they? They were fearful. It says they were troubled. They were scared. The same exact word used here in, in verse number 7. There were some that trouble you. There was fear. There was distraught. The disciples were troubled. The church here was troubled. We must not forget that grace and faith is our salvation. But that same grace is the same thing that sustains us throughout our daily life. It's the same thing that sustains us. It's more than just salvation. We are to live by grace. We stand in grace. We are strengthened by grace. We turn from that. And now we live on our own power. That's pride. That's adding to. And that's so often what we do. I can do this on my own. Listen, I've said it so many times here. Doing right today does not make God love you more than He did when you were doing wrong. That's not who God is. He loves you unconditionally. It does not change. Regardless of you doing right or you doing wrong. But in my mind, I think, well, if I can just do these good things, God will do this more for me. God will love me more. That's not at all. Let me share this with you real quick and then we'll keep, keep going. Trouble in the church. I don't know where you stand, but the thought that comes to my mind is this. What do I need to know so that I don't fall into the temptation of going towards a corrupt gospel? There's a lot of things that sound really good. So how do I know that what you're sharing with me is the truth, is the gospel? Some of us in the room, I'm not going to lie, there would be people in here that somebody could sit inside and they could, they could sit in one of these chairs and they could begin to talk to you and you'd be like, oh, that's so good. Man, that's so good. You become friends, you go have coffee, you go have lunch, you hang out at one another's house. Next thing you know, you've become friends. You've allowed this person to come into your life that is teaching stuff that sounds really good but has its own little twist over here and we just fall and we fall. Next thing you know, that one person now has three people, now has five people and all of a sudden it comes to me and I'm like, whoa, what is this? And I go and now we have a, a fraction in the church, right? It happens all the time. How then do we not fall into that? When we were looking at this, uh, we meet every week over the sermon that's coming up. And this week, Dan brought to my attention one of the, the things that he had heard was, uh, it, it was an illustration that how do, you, how do they study fake money? How does one study fake money? You look at the real thing. So much so that when you see something that might look similar, you would notice it because you know the real thing. It's no different with the gospel. We have to know it. Why am I adamant? Why am I uh, shouting and screaming? We have to know it. This isn't just something that's fun and cute. Lives are at stake. When we come to church and we think that this is just a cute place, 
Oh man, I've got to go over there. They've got so much better music. I want to go over there. Their children's ministries are better. I want to go over there because they do this and they do this and they do for me. No, the church isn't about just doing for you. Man, that's a scary place that we're in. And that's how we choose church. Well, my child likes it over there better, so I've got to go. Pretty sure nowhere in Scripture does it speak of that. At any rate, what does it say? God's Word says in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Test the spirits. Acts 17, verse 11, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And then what does it say? It says, And searched the Scriptures daily. Daily. I can't say it enough. Don't take what I say, write it down, and leave and say, Oh, that was great. Take what I say, write it down, go home and look it up for yourself. You better never just trust me. Go and read it for yourself. I'm not saying that because I'm telling you a bunch of lies. Man, I want you to know it for yourself. The scariest thing is churches that just, oh, well, the pastor said it. (laughs) Sucker. No, search the scriptures daily. You search it daily. I'll be honest. Nothing thrills my heart more than when some of you walk out the door and you say, hey, pastor, I don't know about that. Can you tell me that? That's not what I read. I love it. I hate it, but I love it. (laughs) I do. Because it challenges me And it makes sure that I am saying the right thing. It's accountability. That's a part of what church is. Anyway, got to keep going. Search the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse number 2. We read it already. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Know Him. Know Him. Search the scriptures. We don't want the the false teachings to come in. We don't want to deal with some of those things. We don't want to have the stirring in the church, the trouble in the church because of somebody coming in and doing that. Know the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures and know Him. It will eliminate most all of that stuff. You know why? Because the moment they come in and they begin to say something and you go, hey, guess what? They'll never come back. They'll never come back. I'm not saying that if we all do this, we're going to have a perfect church. We'll never have a perfect church. But a corrupt gospel can be stopped by people knowing the Word of God and knowing God. The effects of a corrupt gospel, there's a punishment, the wrath of God upon the teachers. Psalm 97 and verse 10, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Romans 12 and verse 9, let love be without dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. We ought to hate evil. We ought to fight against that which is not good. What do doctors do? Doctors fight against disease and death. Police fight against illegal actions and so on and so on. Loving parents fight and guard our children against the things that would harm them. I, as a pastor, am charged with protecting and fighting for your spiritual protection. Paul was doing the exact same thing. He was watching over his converts. In 2 Corinthians 11, I'll let you read that on your own, the first four verses. Paul was having a godly jealousy that they would not be swayed by another gospel or another teaching. He states that he was jealous and he was concerned that their people would leave. I'm not concerned that my people would leave and go to another church. I'm concerned that the people of Oasis would walk out the doors and not be in church. When things took place at Oasis seven years ago almost, the biggest thing, and you can talk to my wife and the people that know me, the thing that hurt me more than anything was not what took place for those that were still in church. It was for those that left and never went back. To this day, it hurts. Listen, 
It hurts people. My job, my part of my task is watching over. It's guarding and protecting. It's that I would teach the Word of God. I said this already, but this morning the greatest test of my ministry is not the size of the crowds that I speak to, rather the faithfulness to the Word of God. The gospel has been entrusted to me, and my job is to teach it and to commit it to others. One day I will stand before God, and I will be held accountable to the words that I say to you, and to how I protected and loved you. Talk about scary. You get to sit and leave on Sunday morning. I will be held accountable for everything that I said to you today. I've said it from this pulpit. The scariest thing I do is teaching the Word of God and making sure that it's true to the Word of God. And I don't take that lightly. Why? Here's why. Because this passage says, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him, what does it say, be accursed. That is literally be cast in to eternal damnation. That's not like, that's just not how we don't like you. No, that's harsh. Paul said the wrath of God would come. That is those teaching this false gospel would be accursed to be dedicated to destruction. Paul says, I don't care who it is. If it's me or an angel, if they come and speak another gospel, they ought to be accursed. They should not be listened to. They should be rejected. One of the ways Paul was being lied about was that he had changed the gospel. The Judaizers were speaking ill of Paul, and we've gone through some of those things. But one of those ways was they were trying to attack him as a person. But they also said that he was switching and changing the gospel because he took the gospel to the Gentiles and it couldn't happen. But I would say this, who was Paul? Paul came back to the churches of Galatia. After what? Do you remember? He was, being, he was stoned and left outside of the city to die. And the same people that stoned him, he came back to their city. He came back to them and said, no, but the gospel is being distorted. The gospel is not being taught. I love you. It matters. What's taught behind this pulpit matters. Mike, what's taught in that class matters. Dan, what's taught to those teenagers matters. If you teach children, it matters. It matters. These same people were trying to kill him. Paul was just an ambassador seeking to glorify God. He was not a politician appeasing the masses. I'm far from perfect. But I pray that I will always stick to the Word of God. That I will adhere to the gospel message. I would rather you come to me and say, Pastor, you preach this gospel thing so much that I would stand before you and say, then you're in the wrong place because it's never stopping. That I will constantly keep it in front of you. Though you know it, that I would constantly give it to you, that you would never forget it. And this morning as I wrap up, in verse number 10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And I look at that and I think of this. How? Do we as a church, how do we as a people adhere to and keep the gospel the gospel? It's done this way. You keep your eyes focused on God Almighty and never on the people. If I'm here to make you happy, I'm here for the wrong reason. I've said this, I don't know if I've coined it, I don't know if it's anything to any of you, but I've said this and I say it over and over, and I tell myself this on a regular basis, I do not serve you. I serve God. In serving God, I get the opportunity to serve you. When I take my focus off of serving Him and that I serve you, I need to leave. 
Because in serving you, I am now serving people and I'm not serving God. Do we want to keep the gospel, the gospel that souls aren't lost, but that souls are saved? That our church isn't troubled, but our church is united? Then we serve Him. We do not serve people. We do not please people. And I, I, I believe that you understand what I'm saying. I love serving you. But the only reason I love serving you is because I love to serve my Savior. And I'll be honest, there's days where it's harder to serve you because I'm not in love as I need to be with my Savior. I wish I wasn't as human as I am, but I am. And those days come. This morning, the challenge, the effects of a corrupt gospel, I can't plead with you enough that we would know and search the Scriptures and that we would realize that when the gospel is distorted, people are lost. Souls are lost. And it's not lost for today. It's lost for all of eternity. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. Are you seeking the face of God and loving Him and striving to know the gospel? That the gospel would just grip you and tear you apart. Listen, it's a great thing when God's word pierces your heart and you weep. It's a great thing when God, were, when God just tugs upon your heart and you weep for the person that's across the street that doesn't know the Lord or you weep for your neighbor that doesn't know the Lord or you weep for the, a country that you are trying to do everything you can to love and reach. It's an amazing thing. It hurts. But let me just say this to you. If you don't have hurt today, you need to get back into the gospel. We all ought to hurt because there's a lot of people that are within all of our influence that are lost and on their way to hell. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Again, thank you for checking us out online. If you have never been to one of our services, it would be such an honor to have you as one of our guests. If you have made any decision today, our staff would love to celebrate with you. Would you please email us at info at oasislv.church.